Welcome. I'm Ethan Soloviev, the Chief Innovation Officer at HowGood. I also want to introduce Leah. Do you want to pop on for a second and say hello? Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Happy to be here. Leah Wolf is organizing this innovation online series. We're focusing in these couple months on supply. Previously, we did a whole series on product innovation, uh, product innovation for impact. Uh, and now we're focusing kind of a step back in the supply system, going upstream to look at supply and the incredible uh, producers, especially ingredient producers that are making the ingredients that are going into some of the most leading edge products on the market. So today, I'm very excited to be joined by Lisa Curtis, Naveen Sika, and Tyler Lorenzen. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. What we're going to do is dive in. I'm going to have a conversation with these thought leaders um, for about 30, 35 minutes. We'll have a little interactive community breakout where you get to generate some questions, meet some other good folks, and then we'll come back for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes and do Q&A. Um, so uh, you're also welcome to use the chat at any point. I can't promise that we'll see it and respond to it. Um, but if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat and I will attempt to sort of keep an eye on them and, and integrate them in as it makes sense in the conversation. I think that's it. So without, oh, there's probably one other thing, which is we have upcoming events. So um, there's a bunch of others in this series. We're going to be looking at regenerative supply enablers. Uh, and then also trailblazers in ethical sourcing. Tucker from Imlikesh has got some great stories to tell. And then there's some new stuff coming in packaging. Uh, so we've got uh, somebody from Futamura and then Jay from Associated Labels and Packaging to talk about what's new, what's on the edge, what would regenerative packaging look like? What are some of the new materials that are coming up? So these are upcoming events. They're all free, open to the public. Please come, please spread the word. All right, so without any further ado, let's get back to the show at hand. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm gonna ask as a, we're gonna do a couple little rounds of introduction here, but the first one that I'd love to do is to do a little intro by the numbers. So I want uh, each of you to think of a number that has something to do with your company, with your organization. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to say what that number is and then explain it a little bit. So I'll do the first example. Uh, I'm Ethan from How Good. The number I was gonna choose was 2 million. And that is the number of products at the individual UPC level that How Good has built up in its database over the last 14 years that we assess uh, according to 247 different sustainability attributes and metrics. All right, so now intro by the numbers. Let's go to Lisa and then Tyler and then Naveen. Hey, uh, Lisa from Cooley Cooley. Uh, I'm gonna go with 11,000. That's how many stores we're selling our sustainable, ethically sourced Moringa products in. Awesome. I'll, I'm Tyler Lorenzen. Uh, I'm the CEO of Kiros and I'm gonna go with the number one. And so we do this a lot at Pure. So we go like this and people are like, well, why do you do that? Because because you're the best. And my dad is the founder of our business and he does this constantly. And if you ask him, like, what does this mean? And I think most entrepreneurs can agree with him. It means you will never quit. This is we're not going to quit because it's all about one world. And that's uh, really the foundation of Pure's and, and what we're all about. Awesome. Naveen. I'm going to go with uh, 100. Um, Terviva, we make plant protein and vegetable oil from a tree that's used in reforestation. And this tree, when you plant them per acre over, over a 25 year span, you sequester a hundred tons of carbon per acre. Amazing. I love it. Okay. So let's do that same order again. And now you can do introduce your company, but especially like what's exciting, what's, what's sort of on the horizon, um, introduces to what's coming up and then also say a bit about your company, your role there as you do so. So back to Lisa, we'll do that same little order to start. Cool. Yeah, I'm Lisa Curtis, founder and CEO of Cooley Cooley, and we're the leading brand selling Moringa products. So I think what's exciting is that for those of you who don't know about Moringa, it is one of the most good for you greens on the planet. It's the leaves of a tropical tree grows all over Africa, South America, Southeast Asia. Um, it's more nutritious than kale, better anti-inflammatory than turmeric. And we source it from small farmers, primarily African women, and then sell it in the form of snacks and smoothies um, across a number of stores in the US and online. 
Um, so that's exciting for us. And we actually just launched Superfood Chocolate, which has been really taken off for us. So I guess that's kind of the what's, exciting us, thing on the horizon. Tell us a little more. What's Superfood Chocolate? What is that? What's, yeah. Is it a liquid? Is it a bar? What, what is it? Where can I get it? It's a bark. Um, so kind of like bark things, but way, way better. It's um, low sugar, high and delicious um, and packed with sustainable superfoods. So you can you know, eat your chocolate guilt-free and feel good about um, getting really great nutrients in there and also supporting small farmers around the world as part of that. Thank you. Okay, Tyler. So I'm Tyler. As I mentioned, I, I run a company called Purist. It's a family business, uh, 35 years old at this point, uh, the company is, and I am as well. I started when I was uh, just born. Uh, what is cool about Purist and what we're up to is we're actually starting our largest pea protein plant uh, in Dawson, Minnesota. Uh, this facility was purchased from a dairy company that went out of business, mothballed the facility. It's 200,000 square feet. Uh, and it's in a town of 900 folks. And so over the past three years, we've been retrofitting the facility and had to raise a whole bunch of money to do it because we certainly couldn't afford it ourselves. And now we are done with the project, uh, hired a, over 100 people. Uh, the facility will have you know, 50 year life and we'll touch uh, well north of 150,000 acres of peas, which is important because one of the challenges with peas are there's not a lot of markets for them. And so peas are great for soil health. They're great for uh, biodiversity and uh, the ability to manage weeds. We actually got into pea breeding because of organic farming. And by having areas to sell these peas allows farmers to grow uh, more sustainable crop rotations, not just in where you think about peas being grown in the North, but actually all across the United States. We actually grow peas in 29 different states from far West California, all the way down into Georgia, Louisiana. The whole idea is this notion of biodiversity and, and doing it with plants with offtake for the farmers. So that's the business my dad started. Uh, over the past 10 years, we've scaled it up and you know, we have a whole bunch of people here in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, working on what we call the future of food and we think it's powered by plants. All right, thank you, welcome. Naveen, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Naveen. I'm the founder and CEO of Terviva. Uh, Terviva, we make plant protein and vegetable oil from a reforestation tree crop, as I mentioned at the top. Uh, as a result, the plant protein that we make is carbon negative. It also has really great um, functionality for plant-based foods and it's affordable. And it has the effect of revitalizing, restoring farmland which is really where we started the company to begin with. That's both a biological concept, but also a social concept because we work in communities where there's a lot of distressed farmland. So um, similar to Lisa and Tyler, we believe that connecting the farm all the way to the consumer can have a huge impact in the sustainable goals for our planet. What's, what's up? What's the latest over here? Um, we're working really hard to bring our first ingredient, our plant-based vegetable oil to market in 2022, we're in the middle of standing up a manufacturing facility and working very closely with some CPG companies to incorporate Panova vegetable oil into plant-based dairy applications. That's going to be where we land Panova oil first. Um, I'm, I doubt any of you have tried it yet, uh, but it will be also available at some point as just a culinary cooking oil because it's really fantastic. It's got a golden color, um, a sort of like almost a buttery ghee type color to it. It's got a lot of great body and it's got great nutrition. It's actually a mid oleic vegetable oil. So profile is very similar from a nutrition perspective to sunflower oil, but adds just a lot more character, body and uniqueness to plant-based foods. Amazing. And does it come from the, what is it's the seeds or the leaves or what part it's of the tree? The, is yeah, it's, it's either, it's a good point. It's the beans actually from this pongamia tree. The pongamia tree is native to the subtropics, very commonly found in in India, also found in Southern China and other places in Southeast Asia. It's got sort of two lives. Its first life was as a, you know, an ancient Eastern medicine crop. Uh, the beans have some very bitter compounds that also are also medicinal. Um, and that's why the beans haven't been commercialized into food. It's that bitterness. Uh, we're very fortunate a couple of years ago to have figured out how to use non-petrochemical natural food processing to debitter the beans and to make this delicious plant protein and vegetable oil. So it's the pongamia tree. 
it's a legume. Um, it's very tough, loves to grow in, in poor quality soils. It's actually something fascinating that all three of your companies have as you're working, because I think Moringa does this too. They're all definitely helping the soil, but I think they all fix to some extent nitrogen in the soil along with other minerals. And that's a, it's like a, you know, this is like a super restorative, regenerative panel because in each in your own way, in different climates, uh, in different agricultural situations, uh, each of the crops that you work with has that capability, which is exciting. And that kind of leads me to where I want to go, which is this first question of like, we've been focusing a lot on regenerative agriculture in the previous months. And so I'm curious to hear from any of you, from each of you, like what does regenerative plant-based mean? And how is that just different from like sustainable plant-based or sustainable agriculture? Like what is the, what makes it really regenerative? Each of you have used that term in, in your marketing and your thinking. And so I'm, yeah, I'm just curious how you distinguish it. What does regenerative plant-based mean to you? Anyone can take that away to start. I mean, I think in some ways it's just like smart farming. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to deplete your soil. And if you can grow crops in ways that actually enrich soil health, uh, it's so much better for the environment and it's also better for your crops. You're going to have better crops and, and not need as much fertilizer and, and certainly pesticides. And so, you know, I, I think the interesting thing about some of these buzzwords is there's a lot of folks who've been doing that for a long time. Um, so a lot of our farmer partners, one of examples is one of our, our partners in Uganda, um, he's been growing a food forest um, for a long time. He's been working on this, not because it's hip and you know regenerative agriculture is in, but because it makes sense for his business and um, both in terms of improving soil health and also in terms of product diversification. Um, to you know, have multiple revenue streams. And so one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is how can we as a business innovate with impact in mind? And so creating products with not just Moringa, but other superfoods that grow well and, and pair well with Moringa. Um, and so you know, creating kind of regenerative <laughs> plant-based products. Um, and so that's you know, one of the things that we have started to explore with our super bark, where you're finding baobab and breadfruit and hibiscus and other sustainable, amazing tree crops alongside Moringa. Thank you. Tyler and Naveen, you want to hop in? Yeah, I, for, for us here at Purist, we, you know, regenerative is an interesting word uh, choice given the, you know, some, some of the context that it's highly associated with uh, today. But what we think about is we want to grow and make foods that we can eat and love forever. And forever is the key point. And it, that means it you know, never ends. And thus, you can keep doing it. And I think sometimes the, the word regenerative and, and typical to uh, sustainability, probably a, a great thing. Uh, but once it turns into you know, corporate speak, it, it gets uh, good business is, is certainly more important than good marketing, in my opinion. And so what we're trying to do is really think about, can we do what we're doing forever? And if not, what are we doing to address that? And constantly looking at that, I agree with everything Lisa said around soil health and biodiversity, all those things that need to be true, build successful farmers, but regenerative needs to be a forever type of scenario, not something that is just uh, an improvement from the baseline. The baseline is clearly not good enough, uh, an improvement from that is clearly not good enough. Only good is uh, forever good. Naveen, what would you add in here? Yeah, I, I, I'll piggyback off of what both Lisa and Tyler said. I, I agree that the term regenerative is losing meaning as we get more and more company making the claim in the space. It kind of reminds me of when people talked about clean energy initially. I think we all knew it was about solar or wind. Before we knew it, it became about, about clean coal and uh, natural gas, right? Um, so I, I feel like um, you know we what's great about this panel is we we're defining what regenerative means for Terviva. It means not just doing less bad, but really trying to throw the whole situation in reverse. Let's try to kind of walk back and actually start to literally go in the other direction than we're going right now. So for us, it very much means carbon negative food. Can we do that? through agriculture, through nature-based systems? I think the answer is yes. Um, and it also means this, this concept of land revitalization, land restoration, not just 
you know, using, thinking about farmland differently from an inputs and an outcomes perspective, but also thinking about the communities that are around that farmland and bringing not just biological diversity, like growing multiple things on that field, but economic and social outcomes, right? Like what kind of on-farm value-added activities need to happen to make sure we're breaking that commodity cycle. Um, so uh, it's those two things. It's land revitalization and carbon negative food. Yeah, and I think that I really appreciate Naveen what you were saying there because it one of the trends I'm seeing in the regenerative agriculture movement in, as it's been taken up by uh, the bigger companies of the world and the smaller ones as well, um, is that there's a growing, especially in the last year, awareness that it can't just be soil. Soil is important. We got to do soil, but it can't just be soil. It also can't just be the environment. There is that social, that cultural, that justice, that equity perspective that needs to be integrated in if you're actually going to be looking at regenerating in a holistic way. And I think that's beneficial for the movement. It'll be harder to pull off. Uh, but I think it's really important and we're hearing more and more from the largest companies and from the smallest companies that integrating that aspect in is really, is really key. Um, in the plant-based world, there's a huge growth, as you all know, in plant-based. Um, and I would love to hear it, it, as part of your response to this next question, I don't know, just some of the little signals that you're seeing that are sort of, oh, here's why I think plant-based is going to keep accelerating. We're going to keep hockey sticking here. Like what are just some little things that the, us as you know, uh, attendees here might not have seen, but that you've seen from your perspective, like what's, what's really moving things faster and showing it's going to continue to accelerate if that's what you're seeing. Um, and then alongside that, there's something where I think some plant-based companies might, I don't know, because just the plant-based is good enough, they might feel less pressure to take on more ambitious sustainability goals because it's sort of just like, well, we're already plant-based. We don't really have to do much more than that. Um, do you see that happening? Do you think there's less pressure uh, or are the plant-based companies that you're seeing out there, whether they're ingredient suppliers or product manufacturers, uh, are they really you know, going above and beyond what everybody else is? So. Let's kick it off. Let's go reverse order this time and start with Naveen and, and come back around. Yeah, sure. I, we have a pretty, I think, pretty obvious signal about the acceptance embracing of plant-based foods. It's that literally our product, Pangemia, Panova, vegetable oil and protein are actually being embraced. <laughs> I'm sure none of you have ever heard of it before. I know none of you have tasted it. So the fact that, you know, we're able, we announced a relationship with Danone the fact that with, with Danone and other CPG food companies, big and small, we're working with Panova oil and Panova protein pretty early before launch to incorporate them into their flagship products in many instances. That's just really, really exciting and shows how much interest there is in bringing new ingredients to the market that are, you know, good for the environment, good for communities, but also bring, you know, taste and affordability access nutrition to the, ta to the table. So really, really exciting signal from our side is just how much momentum we have around the ingredients we're bringing to market. Um, yeah, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question around whether or not, you know, we're sort of all just riding on the coattails of the plant-based moniker. Um, I, I, I wanna say it's early and we're still as a community trying to convince consumers to shift to a large plant-based diet. So I think, let you know, Anything is good at this point. I'm still in that boat of like, let's put a lot of really great plant-based products out there because it's going to be better than the alternative. Um, and, you know, yes, let's make sure that we don't, you know, we don't settle for something less than what we can be, right? So like, let's push the standard. Let's talk about, you know, for example, how good Ethan, to your credit, is doing a really great job of putting some really great specificity for food companies on what ingredients and what you know, types of products are really going to be beneficial for our planet. So I think, you know, we need everything to, to keep moving forward and we need to keep pushing the frontier. Yeah, I, Naveen, you're, you, you nailed it on all of those. And just to add a little bit, I think, you know, some of the reports around where our climate is today, I don't know how much of a choice we really have. Like it's, it's on us as industry, it's on us as entrepreneurs and creators to build the possibilities with plants and do it faster so more people will accept. So I think the, the market signals are certainly there with you know, double digit uh, kegger growth year on year and in the headlines all the time. But there, you know, for people that have been around, the plant-based protein wasn't always interesting. Trust me, I felt that trying to sell it. And it was embarrassingly uninteresting at, at some points. Now it, it's, you know, CVS was at our plant, the morning show on Tuesday. I'm like, 
this is crazy. You know, why are they here? And it's because it matters. It's because what all of you are do, doing on this call and all, all of the decisions you make matter to the outcomes of the next 30 years and the next five. And that's terrifying. And I'm not trying to scare anyone, but we have to build accessibility and affordability into uh, our products so more people can try what what's the potential implants are and, and love it and therefore uh, create more markets for farmers. So then farmers will do it. And it's that system that we need. And in terms of our plant-based companies doing enough, uh, I, I definitely think not. Uh, clearly the, the bigger the company, the more they have to have a sustainability strategy that they share. And we're all talking about reduction from you know, the past, like here's what we're doing over here versus, you know, what we always do. And I do think that plant-based companies inherently being good isn't good enough. Purist fell on that camp for a long time. And we were looked at ourselves in the mirror and said, you know what, we, we can't be that. If consumers are going to care, we need to make data-driven decisions, make our impact easy to understand and share that with our partners. And we need to do that now. So we're investing heavy on understanding everything from end to end, from seed all the way to uh, finished food and, and what that means to the environment, what's that, what that means to the, the choices that you make. Because as obvious as it is for all of us, a lot of people have, you know, the food industry has done a dang good job at creating a disconnect from where your food comes from. Uh, our chief design officer always talks about, it's almost like trash. He goes, a trash can is bad, recycling is good. Everyone knows that, but no one knows the complexity of the recycling. They don't think about it. And that's kind of what we've done with food. So we need to make it that simple for people to, to understand. And then we've made it, we're not close to there yet, in my opinion. Miles to go. That's great. Thank you, Tyler. Lisa, what do you want to add in here? Yeah, I feel like, you know, Tyler and Naveen did a really great job of, of talking about kind of the, the plant-based movement overall. So I'll just give one maybe two quick examples. So for the plant-based movement to really succeed in my mind, it can't just be the whole foods shoppers of the world. Um, and one of the things that I've been really excited about is that for the first time ever this year, our sales at Walmart might surpass our sales at Whole Foods, um, which is, is just kind of mind boggling that you know we're talking about a, a green, earthy, plant-based powder. Um, and that is, it's selling incredibly well at Walmart. And I think that's not, you know, indicative of just Cooley Cooley's success, but indicative of kind of this broader shift of more mainstream Americans looking for plant-based products and actually considering sustainability. Um, and then I think the, the second thing is just kind of, you know, more and more consumers are recognizing how plant-based diets make them feel. Um, you know, I've been a vegetarian since I was 12. Um, and for a long time, that was not really a cool thing to be. Uh, it was like the kid at the barbecue who sat there and ate the buns with cheese on it. Um, and now it's like there's, there's plant-based food everywhere. And everybody talks about like, oh, I'm flexitarian or I don't eat a lot of meat. And, you know, we hear it from our, our consumers all the time. They tell us like, oh, you know, I I take your meringue every morning and it makes me feel different. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel more energized. And I think the more people we have who kind of switch to a more plant-based lifestyle and feel that benefit, um, the faster we'll see that system change. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I think this is another trend I've seen in regenerative agriculture is the linking up of soil and ecosystem health with human health. Uh, and there's some great organizations out there that are looking at the nutrient density and the nutrient quality of food that's grown with different practices uh, and how those are starting to come together. And I think uh, there's some tech coming up as well that will allow people almost handheld on your phone or with a little scanner to check the nutrient density of food. Uh, mm. And I think that that will, again, lead more and more decisions because still consumers, many make decisions for their health. And when that lines up with planetary health, uh, we're going to get a real, you know, even further accelerating shift. Even some of the biggest companies like Danone, who how good partners with uh, Danone's, you know, their tagline is one planet, one health. And I think that awareness is really yeah, growing in the larger consumer population. At the same time, as you all have mentioned, there is, um, there's a lot more players coming in and saying, Ooh, you know, we're regenerative, we're plant-based, we've always been plant-based, like there's a, there's a lot kind of crowding in. And so how do you 
how does your company ensure that um, you know greenwashing isn't going to happen to your stuff? Like, how do you keep up the levels of transparency, the deep work that you have done, each of you, with your supply systems, with the producers you work with? How will you sort of uphold that against what could be, as some of you pointed to, this potential greenwashing of this space? I'm happy to start. Uh, so we're a vertically integrated company, so we're a seed company first. And so we sell seed to farmers and then buy what they grow back. And through that whole process, everything stays within our network. That isn't typical. And most specifically in my industry of pea protein, it's almost atypical. Uh, it, it is, frankly. You know, most of the peas are grown in North America, but however, they're shipped all around the world. And then the pea protein products come back uh, to America. So what we look at is plant-based in and of itself is good. Peas in and of itself are good. So growing peas are great, but shipping them back and forth does add a tremendous amount of emissions that we should think about. So what we are trying to do is, you know, if that story by itself doesn't matter, but bringing data into, into it, that does. So on a per pound basis of pea protein, by sourcing local versus so sourcing international, it's equivalent of taking a car off the road in emissions, driving from Minneapolis to New Orleans. And we're talking millions of metric tons, or excuse me, millions of pounds at this point that are, that are getting shipped around the world. So brands are buying so much volume when you start sharing the impact that their choices make, that it's like taking a car driving around the world 30,000 times, they start really thinking about, wow, maybe I should think about a way to tell a story around a uh, transparent supply system that's local. And not to say that, you know, not local is bad, but if you could, should you consider it? And th that is what we've been trying to do is just create transparency and something of value that brands are able to share and consumers get uh, so that, you know, farmers here can be rewarded with more value exchange and hopefully grow, you know, more regenerative and more sustainable crops in general. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I have a pretty similar thought to Tyler. We also are effectively vertically integrated. I mean, we work on Pangamia tree and on GMO genetics, provide those to farming partners, uh, work with existing supply of Pangamia in India directly and probably in somewhat of a similar way to, to Lisa, colloquially sourcing with high traceability. We are, we are vertically integrated. We start with the trees, we go all the way through to the midstream and we end up delivering these ingredients to, to our CPG partners. And I think that's the foundational choice to, to avoid greenwashing is not having, I guess, value transfer in all different parts of the supply chain so that you're, you know, you're, you're managing too many partnerships. And you know, by trying to find common ground in too many partnerships, you can often dilute the impact that you're trying to have. So I think, I think it's a foundational concept to really drive sustainability in plant-based foods is to be to some extent vertically integrated, maybe not sort of all the way down to even owning your own consumer brand or maybe being even all the way upstream on seed genetics, but having a lot of vertical integration helps avoid greenwashing as a foundational concept beyond just the, you know, the certifications and, you know, the standards that you can adhere to and the technology you use on traceability. Um, I would also say that, you know, if the goal is to sort of ultimately reinvent farming to have it be much more sustainable, Again, I'll go back to when you have that degree of vertical integration, you have to view your relationship with your farmers differently than we view it today in the commodity crop world, right? Which is like, you know, all the profit happens before and after the farm, right? And the farms are sort of managed mostly on a loss basis, not actually on making a lot of money, right? Well, nobody's going to take a risk in doing something different on their farm if there's no upside for it, if they're only really managing to downside, right? So. You know, I know, I know Tyler's working on this uh, for sure at, at Purist. Like, how do you change that economic relationship with your farmer to encourage, you know, regenerative farming practices on that field that have them connected to the upside of the product you're selling? Um, I think is, is really, really important to, you know, make sure we keep standards up. So, you know, Ethan told us earlier that we should feel free to engage in debate. So Naveen, I'm gonna, gonna poke back. I think I'm the only uh, B2C company. I know you guys are both B2B. And I think it's actually hard for a lot of consumer brands to be fully vertically integrated. So in, in Cooley Cooley's case, we are, you know, very much 
tied directly with our supply chain. We work directly with our farmer partners. We're kind of very transparent, um, know where, where everything is sourced, have been to the farms, have tested the soil. Um, but at the same time, we manufacture a lot of different products. We're making everything from powders to bars and shots and now chocolate bark. And, and we don't own a manufacturing facility that can do all of those. We in fact own zero manufacturing facilities. We co-pack. Um, and so we are you know, not vertically integrated for that reason. And I think for us, it's really about having a clear understanding of your supply chain and knowing where the ingredients are sourced and then doing some, some audits and, and figuring out you know, what, what's happening on the ground, what's happening at the co-packers, what's happening at the consumer level and where are their areas for improvements. Um, so one small example of that is, is we did a carbon audit. And I think in my head, I was like, well, you know, probably transporting Moringa from Uganda to California is, is the biggest carbon use within our supply chain. And what we actually figured out is it was our packaging um, that was causing the, the biggest carbon use there. And that our supply chain was pretty much carbon neutral um, because of all the Moringa trees we've planted. And so what we ended up doing is, is we switched our about 80% of our business into post-consumer recycled packaging, um, which I'm super excited about. We actually just kind of sent out the email two days ago announcing it because it's now on shelves everywhere. Um, and that, you know, these packages are basically recycling the equivalent of, of 40,000 water bottles a year just from, from selling them. Amazing. Yeah. And I think that also points to the diversity of situations that come from the diversity of crops that you're working with and from the business models that each of you choose. Um, I want to go and look upstream a little bit and also pick up. There was a question in the chat that I think is really great. That's about basically upstream contracting and sort of how are you working with uh, potential either existing producers for peas or potential producers of Pongamia or Lisa upstream in your supply system, um, uh, you know, working with new or adding uh, farmers on the Moringa side, like how are you setting up those relationships? And is there a way that that is different from the industry average? Is there a way that can be towards like a regenerative approach to engaging with suppliers or is it you know standard industry contracting works and makes sense for your business love to hear uh, a little bit about how you're how you're working on sort of contracting and engaging upstream I'll, I'll jump in to start we we have two different aspects to our supply chain the first is we work with an existing wild harvest very large wild harvest supply in india and the second is we literally get trees in the ground in degraded agriculture land in a couple of different spots in the world where we're building kind of de novo pangamia bean supply, often with like sort of diverse biodiverse outcomes happening on the same field. Um, so on the, um, Ethan, right now on the India supply chain, it's, it's really kind of just found money right now. Pangamia is not being used for food. And so we're coming into the market and we're paying for something that people aren't getting paid for today. So there's a lot of opportunity on that. But in anticipation of the fact that that could still lead to disintermediation at some point when pangamia is a bigger thing, we're thinking about how to create more value-added processing or working with partners like NGOs and other FPOs and things like that that are working in different regions to have more than just getting beans, but you know, some degree of storage and some degree of you know, community-based sort of um, aggregation and uh, even maybe some intermediate processing happening right on site, which happens already with Pangamia, but just doesn't happen to food standard. Um, so we're, we're, we're actively working on that to make sure that there's more collaboration and more control happening kind of back at the farm gate than you would see with, um, you know, your classic commodity crop. On the, um, on the growing side, we started planting Pangamia in test plots in 2012 in Florida on abandoned or degraded citrus land. Uh, by 2018, we were able to flip those over to more commercial style relationships. And we did something a little bit different than you might normally see. We didn't actually offer a flat price for beans. We offered a floor price for beans with upside, meaning based on how we actually pull the product through into an ultimate sale, we will come back and share that with the grower. 
Sometimes things like that happen in specialty crops and you can do that. I will say that the negative consequence of creating a contract like that is that it's like 50 pages long versus like maybe like the three page contract that you might get from the Almond Board of California or something like that. But the growers signed up for it because I think they also recognize that, you know, eventually things get commoditized and you're back in the same spot you were before. So we did something really pretty different there. It's a little too early to say whether it's working because we haven't gotten a large harvest yet off of those fields that we started planting in 2018. But we're optimistic that some degree of, you know, we all win at the customer is going to create good behavior back on the field. That's awesome. That's definitely different than most of what we see happening out there. Thank you, Naveen. Lisa or Tyler, how, how are you thinking about this or, or working it in your supply system? You can go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll build off Naveen because I think, you know, Moringa and Pongami are, are similar crops in some ways. Um, so for us, you know, when I started Cooley Cooley back in 2011, there wasn't really a market for Moringa. Um, there were a lot of people growing it locally, but not a lot of people exporting it. Um, so we've really worked hand in hand with our farmer partners over the, the past seven years um, and really tried to make sure that you know, we're helping them improve their processing facility, helping them install solar panels, um, helping them kind of meet all the specs that they need to be able to sell on the U.S. market. And it's something that's taken years. <laughs> There's a, a lot of farmer partners we've worked with who, you know, it, we didn't, we were talking to them every week for three years before we saw any Moringa from that. And, and so I think it, it does really take time. And it also takes financing. I, I think one of the biggest challenges about working with small farmers is often they don't have the capital on hand to do the harvest even, you know, because they they have to pay workers to harvest everything and, and getting all that money together can be really challenging. And so we've done a fair amount of prepayments and different creative financing arrangements to really enable that to be possible. Um, and then I think we just have a, a different level of transparency than, you know, anyone kind of working on a commodity crop of like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to buy this and I'm done. And, and we really, you know, tell them, hey, we just, we just got into Costco and like now we're, we're launching something new and let's figure out like how we work on this together and how we can, you can grow more Moringa, we can sell more of it. Um, it's really more of a, a partnership than, um, you know, a contractor vendor relationship. Awesome. Thank you. For us, Ethan, it's uh, we're talking about legacy agricultural mm -hmm. systems in corn, soy, row crops scenarios, wheat in the Midwest and across the U.S. And give you guys some perspective here. There's you know 90 million acres of corn grown. About a third of that is used to make ethanol, and most of the rest is used to feed animals. There's 80 million acres of soybeans grown. Again, most of that is to process into soybean oil. Uh, and to feed animals. So there's a, a tremendous amount of infrastructure and systems that have gone into this way of life. And it makes sense, you know, since the farm bill, you know, almost a hundred years ago at this point, uh, it's really changed what people grow because they have a backstop effectively by the government that supports uh, those sort of crops. Right now there's a tremendous drought going on across the country that's really affecting people everywhere. So when we were looking at how do we grow more peas, we had to build and de-hassle the system just like the system currently is. So what does that mean? It means seed financing. That means crop coverage contracts, meaning you know, effectively insurance where we partnered with an underwriter and had to, a decade's worth of data to showcase that we can grow peas in these states that peas typically don't grow. So farmers know that there is removing risk. What's happening with the drought is obviously commodity prices are very high. So farmers can make more money by planting soybeans that will never grow than they will by planting something that will grow. So there's a lot of system challenges that we're faced with. But if you start looking at ways to de-hassle it, make the farmers uh, able to make an easier decision. And this is really the world of organic farming lived forever. But when you talk about regenerative or something that is, you know, not necessarily organic. Um, peas for us is the, the reason why we got into it was for organic farmers. But to scale, uh, we do a lot of non-GMO. And with the interest around carbon farming and credits and uh, offsets and insets and all of it, 
it's creating a wave where if we can build the solutions, you know, farmers will do it, uh, but you have to compete with the way the system's set up today. And it's very, very favorable to grow wheat, soybeans, and corn. And that's why wheat, soybeans, and corn are growing more than anything else by a landslide. So we're looking at it from that perspective. And of course, uh, sharing value with the farmer as much as we can, you know, premium pricing, but that means you need to create more value for the whole system. And, you know, customers are only willing to pay so much. So you have to balance it all out. And uh, it's uh, definitely an interesting trick, but scale can really solve a lot, a lot of those challenges. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that I'm hearing from each of you is it's not the same for any of you. There may be some similarities or some principles, but that you're actually keying into the particular crops that you're engaging with in your supply system and matching your approach to it to what makes sense for that crop, for that climate, for that culture, for the economic system that's there. And from my perspective, this is a key part of regenerative agriculture. Uh, there is no single you know, checklist of things that you do to say, oh, we're done, especially when you're thinking about the economic side of it. You have to invest. You have to deeply engage and figure out something maybe that's never been done before in your crop or in your region in order to really make it work for all the farmers, for everybody in the system. Um, so it's really cool to hear that from each of you and how different it is, but also how you're each sort of working to move it forward for the farmers. One of the criticisms that's come to plant-based uh, in, uh, I've heard it more and more. I'm even hearing it out at a restaurant. I'm, I'm overhearing somebody talking about the, you know, plant-based, are you eating the plant-based sausage or not? And somebody else says, and these are people who I, you know, two years ago would never have been having this conversation. They said, yeah, I really like that, but I think it's, it's too much salt and really too highly processed. And I prefer, and, and so I'm hearing this question, you know, all, all over the place. What, what would you say, I mean, to someone who is kind of criticizing or saying, well, all this plant-based stuff is fine, but it's just, it's too highly processed. That can't be good for your health. Um, how would you all respond? I love this question. So the processed foods in general are not inherently bad. They certainly can be. They certainly can be. And it's interesting to watch just the, the way things shape and, and narratives that, that evolve from how foods come to us and you know what is considered process and, and whatnot. So I'll avoid that conversation because that is a that is something we don't want to go down. But in the end, you know, what are we trying to do? Every food is inherently processed to some degree. And are we creating foods that are nutritionally dense and good for people? So processed foods being linked to tons of sugar. And, and that sort of thing obviously are not great to be the majority of your diet, but to look at plant-based meat and say that it is more processed than animal meat is frankly laughable to me. Uh, the, like, and especially as you said, a sausage, I would love to see the identity preservation of the <laughs> inclusions of the sausage back to the, the pigs. That would be very, very difficult, but that is a, you know, that, that isn't the point. The point is like, can you live a healthy life with health, healthy outcomes and in performance if that's what you're looking for by eating a plant-based diet? The answer is yes, we all know that. Can we make the products less, less ingredients and more clean for the consumer? Absolutely. Do brands need to do that? For sure. So there's iter there are iterations of improvement and I, do th I just laugh every time I see this ultra processed food uh, you got it. You got to give it to the big meat guys. They, they definitely move fast. <laughs> okay. Very interesting yeah. perspective. Lisa, go ahead. I mean, as someone who's been eating plant-based alternatives to meat for like 20 plus years, I, I think it's great that there are more options now. I, and I totally agree with Tyler. Like, you know, we, we process a lot of things. We process things in our home kitchens. Like processing isn't inherently bad. And I think there's there's a consumer choice around like what type of product you are looking for. And I think for a lot of people the like veggie, you know, fake meat of old isn't as compelling as, as something like impossible or, or beyond meat. And I've found it really fun um, recently to just kind of like offer it up to people without telling them that it's not real meat. And you get a lot of folks who are like, oh, this is really good. And I'm like, it's vegetarian. And they're like, no. 
<laughs> so I, I think we we need those types of products. We need the products that are can, gonna convince you know Midwesterners like my husband who never want to eat that type of thing that they can eat plant based alternatives. So I'll know to be careful um, at your place when you're serving up a, a steak to be a little wary of what is this from actually from an animal or not. I love that. Hundred <laughs> percent. The view what would you add in here? Yeah. I, I definitely agree with, you know, just the consumer perception versus reality comment. You know, you could eat a fine grass-fed steak at a Michelin starred restaurant and you can pick up a Slim Jim at the convenience store and they're both forms of meat. And, you know, they, they cater to different demographics. And I think that the plant-based space needs to do the same, right? We're going to have our very fine high-end plant-based products. We're going to have our version of Slim Jims. I don't think there's, you know, anything inherently wrong with that. Um, I think what's interesting and, you know, to pull on a comment or a, an accomplishment that Lisa shared, um, I think channels really matter a lot, right? You know, I think we've got to get plant-based products into very accessible channels, channels for consumers. So Walmart versus Whole Foods, um, I think that's, that's just the way that plant-based, I think, really becomes something bigger than where it is today. You know, it's great that a plant-based product might be featured at, you know, I don't know, some very high-end restaurant, but can we get it into like Sonic or something like that, right? You know, that's, that's a goal I think the space needs to move toward. And, and Ethan, it's also we're not trying to replace salads with plant-based meat. Like everyone is like, it's not as healthy as whole vegetables. I'm like, you know, it's, not. it's right. not a salad. It's supposed to be a burger or it's replacing meat from an animal, not a salad. Definitely eat your greens. And so, and, or your moringa shake or what have you. It's, it's such a thank, fun. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And I'm a huge moringa fan, by the way. So I'd love to follow up on that. Okay. Yeah, I want to see a product that gets made from your three ingredients. I want to see it. a P moringa pongamia something. I don't know what it would be, but um, we can do that for sure. That's that'd, uh, be, that'd be awesome. Should, should, should we make a slim gym? Yes. <laughs> the moringa, the moringa P pongamia slim gym exclusive. Green gym. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We'll do a we'll do a special uh, vintage release from How Good. I love it. Um, okay, so. Let's start looking forward. Uh, what's what do you see in the future for plant based going forward? Especially, I'm I'm interested maybe on the product side, but also on the supply side. Like, what's new? What's coming up that will really shift how companies do supply, how ingredient supplier, uh, you know, do supply? What would it? What would it? What's the future look like? And then also, are there some gaps? Are there some like cool gaps that you see coming up that? you're not planning to fill, but you wish some other great startup would show up or some you know, legacy player would step in and, and kind of fill that gap because you're not gonna do it, but it would be really helpful for the industry. Um, what does that look like going forward? I just have a really quick one. If someone can just fix shipping in the COVID era, that would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> International shipping, domestic freight, it's just, it's all gone crazy. Been a, it's been tough and, and many have struggled with that and yeah it's uh it's definitely the kind of thing that needs rapid innovation and we don't have a teleporter yet and it will be interesting to see to see what emerges yeah that's a great one what else i'm excited about the maturity curve of, of plant-based food manufacturing and, and the reason being is you look at something like you know manufacturing of cheese and it's pretty simple we all think it's is what it is and there's co-products that are now the product that people sell, for example, whey protein. And that was developed over a hundred years ago. And now today we have whey protein, 90% that's in every GNC or vitamin shop around and every sports nutrition brand. And as the plant-based food movement goes and creates scale, like these co-product streams, the amount of innovation that can come from them is really incredible. Because remember the Moringa or Pargamia, those co-products all come from a really nutritious source, same with peas. And so how can we create value out of the whole plant? That changes the economic situation for every, every stakeholder in the value chain. And I really think that the new products that will come from it will be pretty cool. We're working on some, I can't share too much, but it, it's certainly game changing and something that's not, not on the market today. And those are the types of things that I see at scale, the plant-based market will really shape. And, make more economic sense so we can 
have accessibility and affordability for all. Awesome. Naveen? Uh, yeah, this might sound a little not obvious or crazy, but we actually see a gap at Terviva in the plant-based milk space. Um, you know, if, if it, I know it sounds strange because there's a lot of product already out there and there's a huge amount of market penetration already for plant-based milks. But if we look at the sort of three dominant forms of plant-based milk on the market, soy has really fallen off. A lot of consumer perception concerns around soy. Almond um, tastes great. It's, it definitely is a, has some texture kind of stuff going on, but it's not very nutritious. It doesn't have a lot of protein in it. Um, and having a lot of protein is sort of a signature thing these days in any kind of food product. And then oats and oat milk tastes amazing. I think has really great properties and functionality, but also is getting some kind of questionable nutrition claims around it, right? Sugars, also not a lot of protein. So we actually see a, a gap there that, you know, we're looking at really carefully because uh, Panova protein is, um, makes a really good sort of liquid application. It's got really great solubility, great flavor and things like that. And we're interested in it predominantly because of the global dairy market and where we see it going. Just taking India as an example for a second. Today, it is the world's largest dairy market. India, it is projected to grow at seven or eight percent a year, which means it's going to double uh, in the next you know, decade. And the productivity of the dairy industry in India is like a 50th per cow compared to the US and Canadian dairy industry. So that means you know, there's going to have to be a lot more cows and a lot a lot bigger of an environmental and social impact of bringing all that milk to market. And, um, and, and, and India and China are nowhere on cheese. And I suspect they will really like it once it starts to become you know, very popular in their market. So there's just a huge amount of growth in dairy. We see a huge social and sort of environmental need for more plant-based milks to, to be in the space. And we just see kind of a gap in what's out there today that we're looking at really carefully. Fascinating. Lisa, any, anything else aside from fixing the supply system that you see as sort of like interesting gaps or opportunities coming up? You know, one of the things I'm really interested in is how, how we can bring more climate smart crops to market. You know, I think Naveen with um, Gamia is a great example, but if you think of like, you know, a decade ago, I don't know if anyone remembers like chia pets. Like we used to talk about chia pets, not chia pudding. Or like, you know, quinoa was not on anyone's radar. And so it's like, how do we turn more of these crops that are eaten in other places that are incredibly nutritious, really great for the environment? And how do we popularize them? Because, you know, to Tyler's point, we shouldn't all be eating wheat and soy and corn. And there, there's so many better crops out there. And so that's what I think of when I think of, you know, we've got plant-based, we've got regenerative. Can we now start talking about climate smart crops and especially crops that are, are really important to different communities around the world and can be sustainably sourced in ways that benefit those communities. Amazing. Okay, let's do a final round here. And just what do you want to leave our audience with? What, what would you like to say or sort of ask for or say to, uh, to summarize uh, plant-based and plant-based supply and that side that we've been digging into here? Um, how would you like to uh, wrap things up here briefly, each of you? Lisa first, then we'll go Tyler and end with Naveen. Um, I'm going to give you two kind of colloquialisms. I think, you know, you are what you eat. And I also think no market, no mission. And so I really ask that all of you, when you're going to the grocery store, when you're doing your shopping, think about everything you buy as being a vote for the kind of world you want to live in, because it is. Yeah, to me, Ethan, you're doing exactly what I want to root on. You know, how do you create conversation and a platform for people to discuss and have opposing perspectives or maybe the same, and but we just act like humans and find a way to make things better? That is really cool. So thank you for that work and what you're doing and everyone to log on. Like, you don't have to. You do all sorts of things. You're choosing to have the conversation, which is really powerful. So thank you all for that. Yeah, and I'll just tag on a little before passing it to Naveen. I think my response to the greenwashing question from earlier really has to do with 
how do we grow a community or communities of people that are working on upholding the integrity of whatever we're doing, whether it's plant-based, whether it's regenerative agriculture, how do we have communities that are consciously working to uphold that integrity, to push back against the people who are, or the companies that are maybe less consciously uh, denigrating or degrading the potential of what it could be. And this is one small version of that that we're doing here, but it doesn't need to be just us. I want more and more folks doing it and having those conversations. Naveen, over to you to wrap it up. Yeah, no, it, uh, thanks, Ethan, Tyler, Lisa. It was a really great conversation. I know we could have gone on for a while and we didn't nearly get to everybody's questions. What, what I would say is, I, I think it's just a really optimistic moment, right? You know, to pull on something Tyler was saying, it, the agri food and agriculture system is big and actors in it are enormous and it is slow and it is complicated. And, you know, the, if there's a good part to the last sort of 50, 60 years of food and agriculture, it's that We've solved you know, a lot of issues around food security, not all of them, but a lot of issues around food security and food availability. Um, and you know, we're on to the next journey here. And I think plant-based foods in general can really help restore our planet. And what's exciting is that, you know, in in Cooley Cooley and in Purus and in Terviva and you know, in a couple dozen other companies, you have these, you know, little big companies that are starting to make the big companies pay attention. Right, Tyler's already literally brought one into his company, right? And they're they're starting to now think differently and act differently. And there's a future here where, thanks to the consumer wanting a lot of change, uh, the whole system is going to change. And that's really darn optimistic compared to maybe some other sectors. If you stick take a step back and look at you know education or healthcare or energy, I think we're living in very exciting times in food and agriculture where you can really imagine a decade from now there being a lot of change from where we are today. And, and so, you know, I'll echo what Lisa said, like, let's keep buying and eating and making plant-based foods. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. This has been amazing. We'll make the recording available, share it around. And again, we've got some great upcoming events. Uh, we hope to see you there on the innovation series. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>